Good morning again. I've been talking forever. Technical difficulties. Part of the things that happen when you lie. I forgot to push the button. Tashira forgot to tell me to push the button. Because I always push the wrong buttons. So I'm blaming Tashira this morning. Yeah. Praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the National Baptist Memorial Church, where the Spirit of the Lord absolutely dwells. For those of you that are joining us this morning right now on the conference line, welcome to you. Good morning. Good morning. Those of you that are joining us live um, on YouTube or Facebook or whatever venue you're joining us on this morning, we welcome you. Greet your brothers and sisters that are there in the chat room. Let them know that you're there, you love them, that you care for them. Um, call somebody. Invite them to come to church with you this morning. Get them on the line. We'll welcome them as well. I'll be back in a few minutes to talk to you again. The praise team is about to take us higher. Praise and worship. Amen.
and our faithfulness. Oh, how great it is to have a faithful God who walks with us and shields us and protects us, who guides us and keeps us in spite of ourselves. Great is our faithfulness to that kind of God who loves us unconditionally, um, who blesses us with our merited favor. Great is thy faithfulness to that God, that kind of God. We love him and we certainly adore him this morning. My brothers and sisters, welcome to the National Baptist Memorial Church. I told you I'm having a little technical. There we go. I think we're all faded out now. Um, let us open up this morning with the word of prayer. Gracious and merciful God, who is faithful to us, who has never, ever given up on us, who has not forsaken us, who blesses us and keeps us safe in his will. Thank you, God. Thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for your unmerited favor. Thank you for the level of grace that you give to each and every one of us every step of the way. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to take us from one week to the next. Thank you for allowing us to see the dawning of a new beginning and a new day. Thank you, God, that even in the midst of a pandemic, yet we are still saved. Thank you for your grace and your good cheer. So God, as a sign of our reasonable service, our reasonable portion, receive our praises today. Receive all the glory, honor that's due to you. Receive us loving on you. We expect to feel you and we expect to hear it from you today, God. Because somebody certainly needs to know that you are near. Somebody needs to be reminded of your faithfulness. Somebody needs to be reminded of your glory. Tabernacle with us right now today. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, welcome once again to the National Baptist Memorial Church. We are so glad that you have come, that you're with us this morning, that you have come to a place of worship. This is an authentic state and space of worship. And we welcome you in wherever you are, seated in your living room, seated in your kitchen, even those of you that might be driving and listening to us through your car. For those of, us, of you that have gotten real fancy and you put us up on the big screen, we say hello and good morning to each and every one of you. We are grateful that you're here and that you are in this space with us. We know that we don't forsake the assembly of the righteous. We recognize that there's a reason and every season there's an opportunity for us to gather together as a family in Christ and fellowship and to be able to take that love and share that love to every man, woman, boy, and girl that would receive it. And so as we extend a warm welcome to you, we ask that you extend a warm welcome to somebody else. Your phone is already in your hand. Text them. Invite them to church with you this morning. Now the praise team is coming now again. They're going to take us a little higher in worship. I'll be back to introduce the real relevant moment with you and then welcome our guests and visitors one more time. Amen? Amen. Never have, you never will. 
grateful for a God that never fails, yes, yes. that has never let me down, that has never left me out, that has always been right there on time, every time that I've needed him to come through. In season and out of season, with me knowing and without me knowing, I'm glad that I got a God that's got my back, my front, my sides all around, that will never, ever, if you're glad about that kind of God that has you covered no matter where you're going, no matter what you're going through. If you're grateful for that kind of God, wherever you are this morning, I would just give him a shout of thanks and praise because he doesn't have to, but each and every step of the way, he keeps on for you and for me. And I'm grateful for that kind of God. I don't know about you, I don't know your testimony, but as for me and my house, we will praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, let's uh, look at the text this morning. Read some of the 27th Psalm of your hearing. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble when even evil people come to devour me? When my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord the one thing I seek most yes. is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, yes. delighting in the Lord's perfection and meditating in his holy temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. Yes. Then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me at his sanctuary. I will offer sacrifice with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. 
This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, there's nothing more relevant than that, that he will hide you in his sanctuary. There's safety from all hurt, harm, and danger in the will of the Lord. And that's good news for us this morning. It's time for the real and relevant moment. Troy is coming with that. Um, and as soon as Troy wraps, I'll be right back to welcome the guests and visitors that have come on in this time that uh, we've already started. But for those of you that are there, you got time right now, real quick, call somebody, invite them to church. Uh, and we're going to see if Troy is going to preach the message for me before I preach. Help me out a little bit this morning. All right, here it comes. Good morning, everyone. No, I'm not going to step on your toes this morning, Pastor. But I am going to uh, reference some scripture this morning. Yes. Um, I just wanted to take a minute. I'm not going to be long. I just want to take a minute to, just to remind everyone who is watching, everyone who is worshiping with us today, that we serve a promise keeper God. Um, a lot of people, <clears throat> you know, we're used to a certain type of promise, a certain type of principle when it comes to promise. And we're used to being let down by mankind. We're used to being let down by our friends or our loved ones when we promise something. But that's not the God. I just want to issue that reminder this morning. Um, and some people, you know, they may not really be aware of the promises of God. But if you look in the word of God, the word of God is full of promises from our God. Things that we can count on, things we can count on. So I just want to bring a couple to your remembrance this morning very quickly in the book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua chapter one, verse nine says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So somebody needs to understand that regardless of where you find yourself, regardless of what direction you see yourself going in, God is with you always. He will be there with you. Um, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40, Verse 31 says, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, these scriptures say something different or deliver a different message to everybody. But for me, that tells me that he's with me, whatever I need, whatever sustenance I need, whatever strength I need. I'm sitting here with a headache this morning, <laughs> but I'm here with everything that I need. I'm in the presence of God. I'm worshiping. I'm with people who I love and cherish. And that's enough. That's enough. Uh, one more from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. So in this time that we're in, in this, this weird place that we're existing as a society, you're not sure what to do. Things are disheveled in this way and that way. But I encourage you, just like the word of God says, put God first. Let him be your first priority and everything will be added to you. Understand that we serve a God who will sustain us, who will fulfill us. And even in the midst of lack, he will give us plenty. He will keep us and he'll protect us, protect our loved ones. So just seek him first and his right. So just to you know, say again, we serve a promise-keeping God this morning. Our God is faithful, promise-keeping. Amen? Amen. Amen. I told y'all, that's a few preachers up in here. <laughs> I'm so grateful for a covenant-making, promise-keeping God that just steps out there and just because for no no other reason that he loves us so and I'm grateful for that I'm grateful that I can hear the word to my ear resonating and even in my spirit that you know I come that you might prosper that and be in good health I know the plans that I have for you said the Lord and if you can hold on to that today my brothers and sisters you understand like Troy said very eloquently we serve a promise-keeping God, and I'll just add to it, a covenant-making, promise-keeping God. And that, too, is good news this morning. Amen? Now, if we were in the sanctuary right now, 
This would be that time that we would all be standing up and hugging necks and shaking hands and passing a peace and letting the folk know about the sweet, sweet spirit that's in the place. Uh, and so we're still going to do the same thing, even from right here. Uh, over over these airways um, and, and and through this living room ministry that we have going on right now, there's a sweet sweet spirit in this place. I know that if it's a sweet sweet spirit here, and you and I are worshiping and serving the same spirit, that it's got to be a sweet sweet spirit where you are too. So my brothers and sisters, once again, that have joined us on the conference line, welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you that are viewing us this morning online, welcome to you as well. Send us a message. Let us know you're here. Send our, your prayer request. Let us know what you need. And the praise team, they're about to hit us with Sweet Sweet Spirit, right? Yeah. All right. There's a sweet, sweet. been um, worshiping here in my home um, in this in this capacity for about four months now. Yeah. Time is moving by really quick. The, the, saying all that, this year is moving by very fast. We're more than halfway through the year. I'm going to tell you all a little secret. When we first started, it was cool outside and the doors and the windows would be open. We had developed a congregation in my neighborhood. Folk would literally put their chairs outside in the front and in the back and they would come to church around my house. And I know that they know that they're missing out right now. We offered to, you know, to, you know, told them to go to the website and then they came back and said to me, Charles, no, just open up the windows. <laughs> open up the doors. We want to hear what's happening on Sunday morning. And that's good news as well. I hope that those folk have migrated over because it's hot. It's almost 100 degrees outside. And I've been telling y'all about how when, when when all of this melanin gets together in this house, it gets a little warm, you know. Um, and, and it is true. It's, it's all right right now. We're, we're, we're doing pretty well right now. But uh, for those of you, I said all that just to say, we seriously extend an invitation for you all to invite someone else into the space. This has been a gift and a blessing to each and every one of us in one way or another to recognize and be able to minister and testify to how God is yet moving. That the building might be closed, but the church is not closed yeah. because we are indeed the church and we're still moving and thriving. And we're going to still keep on singing and we're going to still keep on preaching and we're going to still keep on praising and letting folk know about the goodness of the Lord. Now, one more thing. I don't want to bypass our babies. Uh, summer vacation is in full swing, and we're learning here that school is coming back into session at the end of August, either virtually or part-time in person. I know that, that, that parents all over the DMV are losing it right now because everybody's on a different schedule. Um, and for those of us that have children and even our babies here, uh, look, we're praying for the parents, for the teachers, for the children, uh, for the administrators, and for uh, those people that would have the power, or think they have the power to will to tell people what they have to do um, in administration and in governments to submit to the presence and the will of God, to be prayerful and mindful um, that we keep everybody in perfect peace. Know this, that he'll keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Now, uh, Jesus loves the little children, and because he loves the little children, we have to take that break to let you know that we care about you. We love you, um, and we bless you indeed. Amen. Amen. It's almost that preaching moment, Alan. 
Uh, Praise Team has one more song that they're coming with. And then I will be back with the message for all of us this morning. Amen. Amen. Amen.
fails. We've been talking about this all morning. This God that never fails. Sometimes your parents fail you. Relationships fail you. Friends often fail you. As a matter of fact, we fail ourselves. But right in the midst of all of that, Right when it seems like there is no hope, that all else is gone to the wayside, that you don't have anything else left in you, a still small voice comes to remind you, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will never leave you alone. And all that he is saying is, I'm not giving up on you, so don't give up on me. Keep on holding on in the fight and know that I am God. I am all things at all times are all people that will yield and submit and recognize that not only that, I'm the great I am. I can do all things. I can make all things new. I can turn it all around for you. I can build it all back up for you in the twinkling and in the instant, in the moment, at the snap of a finger. God said, I am. I create. I do things all well. And if you know, my brothers and sisters, that you serve a wonderful, miracle-working God that cannot fail. That cannot fail. That will not fail. Then you can shout the victory already because you already know what happens at the end of the book. We win. You win. You and I, we win because he cannot. Hold on to that this morning. I've seen them work. I've seen them move. I've seen them work. I've seen them move. And he cannot and will not fail. Look, let's go on and preach this sermon this morning. Move my coffee. You know, that's the most important thing for me. Thank you. Remember to keep your social distancing going this morning and keep it up, keep it moving. I have literally masks all around my house. I got them in every room. I got about five in my car. Color coordinated, of course. You know, I have to have something color coordinated to go with what's happening. So just in case, I have extras for people that don't have one. I'll tell you, I'm so serious about this thing. If somebody starts to talk to me, if I'm out somewhere, I will pull out a Ziploc bag and say, here, you're going to have to use one of these in order to continue communicating with me. Y'all better get with that. Stay strong, stay safe. Amen. I'm going to look at a few passages of scripture this morning, referencing back uh, the 27th Psalm where we started just in our devotional word this morning. I'm actually going to... Look at Psalm 27, 
going to go to the end of the psalm. Verse 13 and 14. Psalm 27, verse 13 and 14. And there David is writing. And David says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait. I say wait on the Lord. Then I want to flip over just a few more chapters. I recognize that David was still in the same vein just a few more chapters later when he got to the 37th Psalm. And he says, don't worry about the wicked or envy those who are doing wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and be of good courage and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Listen to that. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take the light on the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust in him and he will keep you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. And the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked scheme. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Let us pray. Flowers wither. Grass fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon. Surely you and I, surely the people, we are the grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains the same. Holy Spirit, have Great God, have Come in this place. Be with us today. We need a fresh word from you. We need a special touch from you. We need a cleansing, renewing hand from you. Open us up, open up our eyes, open up our hearts, open up our minds so that we might receive from you. Move us from a state of just simply sitting and hearing or listening to a place of hearing because we know that faith comes by hearing and that hearing is the word. Move on us right now. Have your way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to preach a short sermon this morning, and I do mean short. Uh, simply preaching on the sermon topic, wait it out. One of the most important appeals that you and I see in the Bible that is expressed so intentionally and intently throughout the Bible is the call for each and every one of us to wait on the Lord. Even though God promises special blessings for waiting, waiting is one of the most difficult and challenging exhortations in the scripture. Why is it so hard then you ask to wait? Because people are naturally, we are naturally impatient. It would be one thing if we knew what was going to happen at the end of our seasons of waiting. But most of the time, we just don't know. Waiting would probably be more tolerable if we actually had a road map to follow that outlined every step of the way. But we certainly don't have that kind of Siri map quest kind of trajectory built in. It might be easier to deal with if we had some very specific waiting at some specific blessing or another waiting for us at the end of a timeline, but generally we don't. 
this kind of concrete word from God concerning future events that could or would or should happen in our lives are exceedingly rare throughout the Bible. Abraham waited a long time before the Lord gave him any children, but he had clear and specific promises from God about what would happen in his life if he waited. For him, it was a matter of believing God's promises, believing God at his word. It may not be easy, and it probably wasn't easy to go through year after year after year of waiting, but at least it's simple. God said it, so believe it or not. The facts are, most of us are waiting for something most of the time. I mean, if you and I knew that after an hour of waiting for that cake to bake and cool and be frosted, and then we would have an opportunity to cut into it and get some, waiting wouldn't seem so long. But if you have to wait and figure out where your next check is coming from or wait on a doctor's report about your health conditions or, or you've been waiting and working out a long time and it just don't seem like those pounds are coming off or you've even been waiting for Mr. or Mrs. Wright and, and, and that's taking too long or, or maybe you're waiting for your spouse or your child to stop acting so immature and grow up. Waiting can seem hard. Waiting is hard to do. But over and over again, we are told in the scripture to wait on the Lord. We, we, we don't like to wait. And when we think of waiting, we are more likely than not to do some things that will mess everything up. Oftentimes, my brothers and sisters, instead of just being still, like David said, and trusting the Lord, we interject what we think or what we feel, and we miss out on the lessons that waiting is meant to teach each and every one of us. Ultimately, one of our needs in the game of wait, W-A-I-T, on waiting on the Lord is our ultimate need to cast every weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, every burden on him. The simple fact is, in spite of our modern age, and our dislike for waiting, life is full of waiting. And one of the most challenging exhortations then, like I said, in scripture is simply just to wait. But waiting despite our impatience and our dislike for it is a vital element in life. We think of waiting when we think of waiting on the Lord. There are a number of very critical and important questions that we have to ask and that need to be understood and even need to be answered, especially when we consider these things in light of the principles and promises that are packed in to the Holy Scripture. Why? Because these particular questions and answers, they teach us to be still and trust God. The Bible gives us many promises about God's goodness and love towards us in general, and we should hold on to those promises and trust that he causes all things to work together for the good of them. And because the Lord tells us to wait, because the Lord tells us to wait, and since it has some wonderful benefits attached to it, we need to know what it means to wait and what we should do while we are waiting. The Bible then, the Bible gives us many examples of people who waited for God. Consider the story of Joseph and the story told of Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. God blessed Joseph richly and used him powerfully, but only after Joseph had been in slavery and in prison for many years. Joseph's example of waiting appears to be more closely aligned to the types of experiences that we have because Joseph had no specific promises from God concerning his future. Listen, Jacob waited for Rachel. Noah waited on that ark. Habakkuk waited patiently. Job prayed and waited. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was waiting for a fulfillment of the promise that her son would be the Messiah. Waiting is hard. Inactivity is 
maddening. It will drive you bananas. And that's why so many people can't and won't be still and stay at home long enough for sensible people to get a grip on this current pandemic. I, I don't mean waiting like just lying around and watching TV kind of waiting. I mean having no direction or purpose in life kind of waiting. It makes you feel like you don't matter anymore. Sometimes it can be crippling, uh, even crippling financially. It, it, if it involves perhaps you waiting for a job to come and you haven't worked in many, many months. And one door after another one slammed in your face. Then, of course, as a result of that and, and the result of your financial troubles, more things are put on hold, which cause you to wait. It's easy to feel angry and betrayed or to lose hope and to give up. Some of us may even feel rejected by God. You know, I'm trying to serve him as best as I can. I'm trying to give him the glory that's due. But it seems like he's absent. He's quiet. He just does not care about what's going on with me. When life is at a standstill like that and every path seems like a wrong turn, what do we do? Well, let's take a cue from David. He says, I waited for years to be king. And even when I became king after being anointed, to be king, I still had to fight to keep what was promised to me. This psalm, the 37th psalm, juxtaposed with David's words in the 27th psalm, I had fainted. This psalm contrasts the destiny of the wicked with the future of those of us that are righteous or called to be righteous. The wicked might prosper, but through the Lord's help, David says, we will always win. In this psalm, David contrasts the conduct and the behavior of the wicked with the grace and the righteousness of those who God has called righteous. The wicked oppress the poor, the wicked borrow and do not repay, the wicked plot against the just. But on the other hand, the righteous, they, the righteous shows mercy and they give uh, the righteous, uh, his mouth speaks wisdom and his tongue talks justice. The message of this psalm is to wait patiently on the Lord because the Lord is faithful and true. Listen to what the psalmist says. Fed or feed on God's faithfulness. Trust in the Lord and do good. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust always in him. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Wait on the Lord and keep his ways and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is the strength and your strength in times of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. But the most striking part of this psalm and the most popular and familiar part of the text is in verse 25. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. The promise of this passage has a resounding similarity to what the Hebrew writer wrote in 13 and 8. I will never leave you nor forsake you. For us, this is comforting because through every trial, struggle, battle, and promise the righteous have, the promise of God, uh, the promises of God are being with us. God has never forsaken his people. God never leaves us to fight alone. And he never, he will absolutely never abandon us. Whenever we are dealing with any harshness or adversity, we should remember God is with us. If God is with us then, y'all, who can be against us? And that's why Paul was so clear to say just that. And the answer to it is no one can defeat us and no enemy formed against us will ever prosper. So David interjects himself into this psalm. And he says, there are just a few short things 
that you need to do while you're waiting on the Lord. David says, I'll use myself. I'll put myself into this thing and I'll start out by sharing my experience. He says, I have been young and now I am old. These are not the words of a novice. David is not a neophyte. He is an experienced man. The glory of young men, as he says, is their strength. The beauty of old men is their gray hair. And when I looked at the text, there is something that really stuck out to me. The transparency of David. And, 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 and I'm thankful, y'all. I'm thankful, once again, for David's transparency. It seems that he consistently opens up his heart throughout the psalm, much like when he said in the 27th psalm, I had fainted. David said, there was a time in my life when I felt like giving up. Can anybody testify to that? There have been some times in your life where you just flat out felt like giving up. You felt like throwing in the towel. David pulls back the mask and allows us to see all of his issues. And he admits to us that sometimes the pressure of life made him feel like giving up. He said, I had fainted and I almost gave up. And when I look at the text, the wording that David used is very interesting. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because in that instant, David said, I had fainted. He did not say, I would have fainted. He did not say, I could have fainted. He said, I had fainted. When David said, I had fainted, David was not referring to some kind of illness, ailment, or weakness of his body. But he was suggesting something that was happening in his life. He is talking about something that was so detrimental, something that was so major, some kind of milestone that was so catastrophic that it affected and impacted everything in his life. It weakened him spiritually. It weakened him emotionally. It weakened him physically. And, any, and somebody in, in, in this space where we are this morning, somebody can relate to what David is going through. Somebody can testify there have been times when you were so down on yourself, down in the dumps, that you were so weakened, but it wasn't necessarily something physically is happening to you. It was something in your spirit that just wouldn't let go. And it was working on your mind and it's working on your body and it's working on your soul. Somebody knows that there is nothing like a spiritual attack that will suck the life out of you. It'll literally steal the joy that you have. David, this David has seen the fullness of life. He has tasted the bitter and the sweet. He has experienced both pleasures and pain. David can provide expert testimony, expert witness concerning the faithfulness of our God. And through everything David faced, whether good or bad, God never forsook him. God never left his side. Forsake. Forsake in the Hebrew sense means to leave, to abandon, to stray, to leave some dependent of yours by the wayside, to leave someone alone with the very problems that they came to you about. David experienced many hardships. David experienced cruelty from his family. His father overlooked him. His brothers despised him. His son attempted to uh, 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 kill him and take his throne. He fought lions and tigers. Uh, Saul tried to kill him so many times. It was too many times to, to talk about. David spent time hiding out and on the run, and he knew hunger and lack. But David's son still gave witness, still testified to God's faithfulness. David said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David said, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and day that dwell therein. David says, the heavens declare the glory of the firmament of the Lord and show of his handiwork. It's interesting then, my brothers and sisters, that oftentimes scholars have challenged the words of David throughout the Psalms. They concluded that it's impossible for one person to go through this many emotions all at one time. 
They have argued that the tensions in many of the Psalms, they just seem too great. Too many conflicts and moods are presented. They contain complaints, and then they often complain, pra contain praises right in the midst of the complaints. And well, I have to submit to you all then that these scholars must have been, uh, must have never been through anything in their life because their perspectives are too narrow. Their perception is skewed. Their level of discernment is completely off base. These must be people who are just too righteous, too holy, and too pious because if they had ever been through anything in life, if they ever had been through some stuff in life, they know what David was talking about through this entire hymn book because when I have gone through some things, more than I could bear for myself. Sometimes I would have just to need to shout out much like David so I can remember who and what God has been to me. And that's what made David shout out when he was surrounded by a camp of people trying to kill him, hiding behind a rock, and all he could do was encourage himself in the Lord. Because sometimes when life is crowding you about like that, you've got to simply just cry out to the Lord and encourage yourself. It's obvious then that these scholars, these men and these women, it's obvious to me that they never had to wait on God for anything. Because if they ever had to wait on God to bring them out, if they've ever had to wait on God to bring them through, if they've ever had to wait on God to bring them over, they would realize that David's emotional response was completely normal. We don't know when David sat down and write all of these psalms, the truth is, it doesn't even matter. The essential point that we need to understand is that this was a man that had been through some things, yet here he is waiting, waiting on the Lord to do something new, waiting on the Lord to make a way out of no way, waiting on the Lord to show up and show out on his behalf, waiting on the Lord. So David says, while you are waiting, insert your experiences and remember the experiences that God has carried you through. But not only that, use yourself as an example. David says, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. David is an example for us of righteousness. It's not ultimately David's conduct or David's behavior that makes him righteous. Let's remember that David was the, the same man that committed adultery, that stole another man's wife, that put that man on the front line and had him killed. Let's remember that David did nothing to protect his own daughter who was abused by another. Let's remember that David realized, though, his sinful state and his level of imperfection. And that's why in the 51st Psalm, he could say, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always and evermore before me. I say this not to detract from David, nor to make light of sin, but rather to demonstrate that the best of us have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord. And what God is ultimately concerned with is not the outward what made David righteous were the conditions of his heart and his faithfulness. David was a man after God's own heart. Don't you remember in 1 Samuel 16 when Samuel came to anoint, God said, why do you continue to cry? Why do you continue to cry? Why do you continue to cry for that other man? For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David, my brothers and sisters, represents a, a, a type of Christ in the Old Testament literature. And he represents that image of Christ in his struggles and in his kingship. And so when he was separated from the grace of God's presence because of his sinfulness and his sinful ways, he could pen the 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Don't be too far from me. Remember, Jesus uttered those words, too, because for the first time in eternity, God, the son, was separated from God, the father. And the nature then of the penalty that Jesus suffered necessitated that the father leave him alone for a little season 
Because on the cross then, and because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, more than David or any other man could do, uh, he became sin for you and for me. He, the Bible says, for he made him know who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. On the cross then, Jesus was treated as the worst sinner of all. He was treated as the worst murderer, the worst thief, the worst idolater, the worst liar, the worst of us all. He became sin for us that we might live and we might live in peace. In Christ, the sinless became the sinful in order that we might become righteous before God. Apart from him, we have no righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one. Isaiah says, surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Because of the work that Jesus did, my brothers and sisters, because he was forsaken on the cross, the righteous don't ever have to worry about being forsaken. We are confident, and I say willing rather, to be absent from the body is to be present with our Lord. And you know what? You and I should be glad to know it, both that in life and in death that we're never forsaken. We may be beaten, we may be oppressed, imprisoned, rejected, despised, but never forsaken. We may be hungry, poor, uh, a single, sick, hated, and imperfect, but we're never forsaken. We may uh, be turned down for a promotion. Uh, uh, we may uh, be having issues with our children, having difficulties in our marriage, fighting some temptation, but we are never forsaken. Now listen, I told you this was a short, short message because I'm already done. But as I take my seat, I'm reminded of a story. Horatio Spafford, he, he had been a successful attorney and businessman in Chicago. He was the husband of one wife and the father of many children. He was an active member of a Presbyterian church that he belonged to. He was a loyal friend and a supporter of D.L. Moody, who we're fully aware of in Chicago. His life resembled the life then of Job. One of his sons had died at a young age, but he followed by the great fire in Chicago. As a matter of fact, he nearly uh, was bankrupted because he lost everything. And so he decided with all of this tragedy, the loss of a child, the great Chicago fire and losing just about everything, that he would take his wife and his remaining children and that they needed to go on a trip. They needed to get away. And so they planned to get on a boat and go with Mr. Moody to go to Great Britain. And, and he figured that while he was there, he would do some evangelizing of the people with Moody. And in November 1873, he was detained. He had to stay back, but he sent his wife on with his children. And they all boarded this ship called the SS Ville Havre, planning to join them later on. He said, go on, you all start the trip. We need to get away from this place. Halfway across the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was struck by an English vessel and it sank uh, in 12 minutes. All four of his daughters, Tanetta, Maggie, Annie, and Bessie, were among the 226 who drowned that day. And his wife, she lived, and she sent the telegram, and it simply just said, saved alone. Later, he stood hour after hour after hour on the deck of a ship, carrying him to meet his wife. And at the very moment when the ship that he was on passed the approximate place where his precious daughters had drowned, he took out a pen and paper and began to write these very familiar words. He said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot has taught me to say, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Sometimes, y'all, waiting on God yanks at your soul. Uh, you don't know what to do. 
But I, can I encourage somebody this morning? Veterans have something called basic training. The commanding officer orders you to put on all of your gear, your helmet, your boots, your weapons, and backpacks, all of your gear. And you have to hike up mountains and trudge through waters with your gear on. You have to crawl through trenches and swing through trees with your gear on. You have to run many miles and jump over countless things with your gear on. And at the end of the day, you are tired and you feel like you are about to give up, give out, and just die. But after a few weeks have passed, you look at yourself in a mirror and you have muscles coming out of your arms that weren't there before. You have a washboard stomach that wasn't there before. Your legs don't shake uh, when you stand up anymore. You can run longer distances without getting tired and, and you're ready to go on and fight the next battle. The trials of life are like basic training. God orders you to put on the helmet of salvation, our boots of peace, our breastplate of righteousness, our shield of faith, the sword of the spirit and gird our loins with truth. We go through divorce and sickness with our gear on. We go through unemployment and failing grades with our gear on. We go through bankruptcy, confusion, and anger with our gear on. When it's over, we feel like we are about to give up, give in, and die. But when the next battle comes, we find our prayer life is much deeper because we had all our gear on. We, we, when, when the next battle comes, our, our, our study of the word is deeper because we had all our gear on. When the next battle comes, our worship is sweeter because we had all our gear on. Now that might be too spiritual for some folks. So let me share it with you like this. Sir Walter Lee Mack shared this story about an old preacher. He said the old preacher was boarding a flight. He had to pass through first class on his way to sit and coach. And while boarding the plane under his breath, he was singing, Jesus, you are the center of my joy. And while singing this song, an elderly woman sitting in first class stopped him and said, Sir, I hear you singing that song and I'm not feeling too well. Do you mind praying for me? And right there, while everybody was putting up their bags overhead, he whispered a quick prayer of healing. And after he prayed, the elderly woman thanked him and he went on to his seat and coach. To his surprise, as he was walking, he realized that he kept walking and his seat was the last seat at the back of the plane across from the lavatory. Uh, right after he had buckled himself in and the flight attendant was talking and had finished her speech over the intercom, she walked up to him and said, sir, I'm not supposed to do this, but I saw you praying for that woman in first class, and I just thought if anybody is on the plane praying, they don't need to be in the back of the plane. They need to be in the front of the plane. But sir, would you mind if I bumped you up and moved you to the front? And in a matter of minutes, God moved him from last class to first class. What am I trying to say to you this morning? Sometimes you might feel as if you're in the last seat of life, last to be recognized, last to be considered. But if you wait on the Lord and be of good courage, if you wait on the Lord and trust him, if you wait on the Lord, he will strengthen you. If you wait on the Lord in a moment, God will change your seat. This great flight attendant can move you in the matter of just a second. Listen, you are not alone, and you've not been forsaken. There is a witness in David in the text. David said, and when all of these things happened to me and I had to wait, I felt like fainting unless I believed in the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. David said, I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. And if I'm going to see it, it means when the dust settles, I am going to have to be around. If I'm going to see it, obviously, when I get over the traps and the snares of the enemy, I'll still be around. He said, I believe I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that's all that I came to share with you. This Remember your experiences. Use yourself as an example. And then encourage not only yourself, but somebody to wait on the Lord. 
to hold on to God's unchanging hand, to be faithful to him and his word, and he will never fail you. If you believe that, my brothers and sisters, wherever you are, celebrate our God together, recognizing that God has not failed us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Wait, I say wait on the Lord. Look, we never want to leave this place and we never want to leave this space without giving you an opportunity to welcome the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, into your heart. For those of you that recognize that it seems like you've been waiting forever, you've just been waiting on the Lord forever, even in this season where seeming to have to wait has been forced upon all of us. You just don't know if God is listening or God is near. I come to let you know today when it seems like God is far, God is absent. He's been rather active on your behalf. He's always faithful to you. He's always faithful to you, but he's teaching you. He's equipping you. He's preparing you. And so this morning, I extend a hand to you, my brother. I extend a hand to you, my sister, to let you know, just hold on just a little while longer. More of us are praying for you and praying with you and holding you up. God's loving hand of provision is surrounding you. And if that's you, and you recognize this morning that although you're waiting, you're hearing God usher you. It's time for you today to say, I yield. I yield. Hold on. Don't give up. Now, if that's you, repeat this prayer with me. God, I love you and I adore you. Bless your holy name. For you've been a good God, a faithful God. You've been true. I submit to you today, I yield, I yield, asking you to forgive me of all of my sins. I say, Lord, have mercy on me today. Clean me up and make me new. I confess that you are absolutely the son of the living God, that you suffered, bled, and died for my sins. But on the third day, you rose up with all power in your hand, and you are now seated at the right hand of the Father. You're interceding on my behalf, and I thank you. I believe that you are my God, and I am your child. Have mercy. If you prayed that simple prayer with me today, I believe, my brothers and sisters, that you've been redeemed, you've been saved. It's just that easy. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is that he is the son of our living God, that he is your source, your salvation, your redeemer. Trust him and wait. I'll be right back in just a second.
Just wait. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Hope you receive that word this morning. But sometimes just be still and wait it out. The Lord won't fail you. And if he has you waiting for it, it's going to be real good when it gets there to you. Yeah. It's just brewing in the background. So let me help you in this moment. It's offering time. It's giving time. Put a smile on your face. Some joy, some cheer in your heart. And get excited about giving to the Lord. Look, get the best gift that you have. Get the best gift that you have. You can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. The more you give, the more he'll give to you. The more you give, the more he will give right on back to you. Believe that. So, you know, with a smile on your face, you grab your offering. Even if you don't have an offering this morning, still raise your hand wherever you are because we believe that God is releasing into the atmosphere special gifts and blessings on each and every one of us. It's more about more than about money. It's about your faithfulness to God. If you trust him and watch what he'll do, for those of you that are online, you can give by hitting the offering button that's there. For those of you that are on the phone, you can mail in your offering to National Baptist Memorial Church, 16th Street, Columbia Road, Northwest Washington, D.C., 2009. For those of you that are in the neighborhood, like the members that I saw yesterday walking around the church, if you're walking around later on today, drop your offering in the mail slot. Amen. Now let us pray. Gracious God, look down on these gifts. Bless them indeed. Cause them to be, uh, uh, to be good in your sight and abound graciously. Press them down for us, God. Shake them together. And then allow them to run over in every area of our lives that we might see goodness in the land of living and do good with the resources that you've given to us. So now we cheerfully give back to you in proportion of what you've given to us. Thank you, God, once again. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. And amen, my brothers and sisters. Look, our God is a good God. It's caused us to just wait a little while, wait on him. But he's promised that if we wait, no matter what's going on, when the wicked come against us, when the oppression comes upon us, when sickness, famine, disaster, disease come upon us, if we wait on him, at the end of it all, not only will he be there waiting for you, but he would have carried you through, waiting to provide for you much more than you could ever expect. Uh, as we leave this week, I want you to carry that word in your heart with you all week long, knowing that and being confident and assured that God will not forsake you and he won't leave you. Um, and I also want to just leave with you a word of comfort and cheer. Carry with you. Just say all week long. There's no God like you. There's no God like you. Look, until next week, Praise Team was about to uh, close us out with the selection, but I'm going to offer up the benediction. Um, you know what? I forgot to say hello again to all of you all. So I'll just say I love you and there's nothing that you can do about it. I, 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 I forgot to say it at the end of the service like I normally do, but it's okay. I love you all and there's nothing that you can do. Guess what? Let us receive now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you, 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 and even you could ever ask, think, or imagine to the only wise God who is faithful, just, and true, who is worth waiting on. Yeah. We say thank you. Be all dominion, majesty, glory, and honor, henceforth, now and forevermore. And my brothers and sisters, go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace.